So our first panelist is Victoria de Francisco Soto, who is an assistant dean at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and a contributor to MSNBC and Telemundo. Her areas of expertise in the domestic policy landscape include immigration, Latinos, women and childcare, and economic inequality. And Victoria serves as the chief diversity officer at the LBJ School. Our next panelist is Jonathan Acosta. Uh, Jonathan Acosta is a father, educator, Eagle Scout, youth wrestling coach, and doctoral student in sociology at Brown University. His academic work is in the area of political sociology, social stratification, segregation, race, class, and ethnicity. Uh, Jonathan is a member of the Juvenile Hearing Board and a city council person representing Ward 1 in Central Falls, Rhode Island, where he has been a strong voice for responsible green city planning, transparency and governance, and affordable housing, and he is also the Rhode Island District 16 Senator-elect. Our next presenter, uh, roundtable participant, is Gerardo Cadava. Uh, Gerardo Cadava is an associate professor of history and Latina Latino studies at Northwestern University, and he is the author of two books. Uh, the first is Standing on Common Ground, The Making of a Sunbelt Borderland, published by Harvard University Press in 2013. And the second one, uh, which is especially timely, is The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump, published this past May by Echo, an imprint of HarperCollins. And our third speaker, or our fourth speaker, I can't count this morning, uh, our fourth speaker is Maria Hinojosa. Uh, Maria Hinojosa dreamt of a space where she could create independent multimedia journalism that explores and gives a critical voice to a diverse American experience. She made that dream a reality in 2010 when she created Futuro Media, an independent nonprofit newsroom based in Harlem, New York City, with the mission of creating multimedia content from a POC perspective. And I definitely encourage folks to look at the bios in the chat, to Google these folks, to uh, buy the books that they've written, uh, and just follow them on social media. So I'm really excited to um, have everyone here, and um, we'll pass it along to our first speaker, Victoria de Francisco Soto. Gracias, Kevin, and saludos to everyone, my fellow panelists, um, everyone tuning in, greetings from Texas. Uh, so what I wanted to do, my background is a political scientist and, and you know, my areas of expertise have always centered on um, political behavior, public opinion. So I was gonna start there in giving just a very broad brush context of what happened. I was thinking about it this morning a month ago, even though it seems like eons ago, it was a month ago that we had the election. So Biden won 70% of the Latino vote. Let's just start with that. I think that there has been so much focus on different elements of the Latino vote that that kind of big aggregate number gets lost. So I think it's important to start with that number of seven out of 10 Latinos across the United States cast a ballot for the Biden-Harris ticket. Now, have we seen greater Latino support for Democratic presidential candidate? Yes. Have we seen less Democratic support for the presidential candidate? Yes. So this 70% is neither the high water mark nor you know, a, a, a low in terms of where those have stood in their support for Democratic candidate. Within that number, however, that's where all uh, chatter and all the interest stuff plays, right? I think one of the things that was really remarkable this time around was the extent of the gender gap. So we've always known, or at least for the past four decades, that women tend to prefer the Democratic candidate for president, black, white, brown women. But what we saw in this last presidential race is a widening of that gap where Latinas were preferring Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate, by figures that we had yet not seen. So I think that's kind of a, a notable in terms of Latino turnout. The other piece was turnout. This is huge. You know, we have the dubious honor of always being, you know, last when it comes to turnout, but we saw a glimmer of what was to come in 2020 and 2018 when Latino turnout shot up and we saw it again. So we have turnout, we have the gender gap. Now, when you get below those general numbers, below that 70%, 
the really interesting stuff that the media latched onto, because the media is the media, uh, is, oh my God, Florida. Oh my God, Miami-Dade County. We, we saw a preference for, for President Trump with Latinos in Miami-Dade County. Yeah, if you follow Latino politics closely, if you follow Florida, if you follow the voting trends, if you follow kind of the history of this, and I know Jerry's gonna really dig into this, you're not going to be surprised, but I think the national media, just nationally, the idea was Latinos will automatically vote D and it's just more complicated than that. And then we saw that narrative about Republicans grabbing some Latinos in Miami-Dade spread over to my home state of Texas, where we saw in the Rio Grande Valley, a number of counties really increase their, uh, their vote press preference for the Republican candidate. And in one or two counties, we actually saw the Latino vote go for President Trump, right? So again, this narrative that if you were just kind of listening to some of these media outlets, you might think, oh my God, we're Latinos going R. What, you know, what is so important about discussions like these is where we can pick apart the nuance. And the nuance begins with the fact that Latinos are a very diverse population. We are a pan-ethnic group that's loosely locked together under this umbrella that's called Latino, Latinx, Hispanic. So there's so much diversity there as a result of our immigration experience, as a re result of our regional background. So part of the differences in voting trends lie in that diversity within the Latino community. And the other take home for me in, in unpacking these, these trends that we saw in 2020, especially these kind of eye-popping Florida and Texas trends, is also understanding that all politics is local. I, I abide by that fully because that is really the key together with understanding that Latinos are a diverse population to knowing that, well, when you look at what was going on in the Valley and you look at the fact that for a lot of folks, their livelihoods, their families' livelihoods were pegged to the oil and gas industry and that the Republican Party did a very good job of connecting with Latinos on those issues. Also that understanding for many of these Latinos in the Rio Grande Valley, they're not necessarily supportive of immigration expansionism, that they sometimes can be immigration restrictionists. So understanding these local level politics were really key for these races. And, and I'll finish on this point, which is understanding the impact that the pandemic had with regards to outreach. So we know from research, some of the research I've done, that direct contact is always the most effective contact. That contact where someone knocks on your door, you talk with them, you engage in our Latino community, we invite them in for a cafecito. That didn't happen because of the public health concerns that the Democratic Party had and that they were sticking to pretty, uh, pretty rigid guidelines. So one final example that I'll give here is in El Paso, in one of the, the congressional districts where you had Gina Ortiz Jones running against Tony Gonzalez. This was a, a seat held by Will Hurd before he, he left Congress. Gina Ortiz Jones knocked on zero doors. Tony Gonzalez and, and his, his support team knocked on 27,000 doors. So in these very tight races, the impact that this direct engagement that Republicans were able to have this direct engagement with Latinos who might've been on the fence was really critical. So let me, let me zoom out here and just you know, leave you with the couple of biggies, which is understanding the top line, but the devil being within the details of what our demographic makeup is within the Latinx umbrella, all politics being local and that shoe leather politics matters when it comes to campaigns. Thank you, Victoria. And, and, and I want to start off just by giving shout outs uh, to the CSRA and, and to Brian University for putting this together. Uh, also to, to my fellow panelists, it's, it's a huge honor that, you know, a 17 year old boy who got to Brown in 2007 uh, had to, to, to be in a space like this with, with folks like this. So, so thank you, uh, Gerardo, Victoria, um, Kevin, 
And, and also, uh, Maria, I, I would be remiss to not mention that uh, in a graduate seminar, we were asked who our favorite public sociologists were. And one of my brilliant colleagues, Katie Duarte, was like, Maria Hinojosa is the one. She is the leader of our community in public. So, so just it really dope to be here with you all. Um, I, I want to frame my, my comments around uh, three, three different uh, paths, so to speak. Uh, the, the, the first is Latinos and, and Hispanics as a group. Uh, the second is, is a, a localized, contextualized, and historical understanding of Latino politics. And the third, where I'll spend most of my time, is, is really uh, shifting the lens and focusing on, on the parties themselves. Uh, we've been talking a lot about voters, and, and I feel like the onus should be and needs to be on parties, and, and, and you'll see why when I, when, I, when I get to that. But, just, you know, starting with Latinos and Hispanics as a group, um, Ethno-racial identity has started to, to be accepted as, as a master category, a fundamental cause. And it gets treated very much like class sometimes, where, you know, as Mark said, moving class in itself to class for itself, we make this assumption that, well, Latinos who voted uh, for the Republican Party or for Trump somehow just don't understand their interests. They have this false consciousness. But, you know, I would add my voice to the chorus of people screaming that Latinos are not a homogeneous group. Um, they, they have various interests that, that don't always intersect across this particular identity. So not everybody who is grouped under the umbrella Latino Hispanic sees themselves that way. Identity is about belonging. And so it's not the case that, for example, Puerto Ricans or Cubans really care about naturalization or immigration issues. Because up until, especially for, for the latter, until the wet foot dry foot policy was challenged, um, they, they weren't facing those same issues on the ground in their lived experience. And so to say that all Latinos need to vote or should be voting a particular way, um, I, I think is, is, is something that Geraldo will tell us more about, but, but, but is wrong in, in this large popular narrative. Um, the second, and, and I'll, I'll stick to Cubans, and, <laughs> um, Victoria mentioned Miami, which is, which is where I grew up. And you know, a, a very localized, contextualized and historical understanding is important for us to be able to explain some of the voting behavior. And so it's not just that Cubans or some Latinos are afraid of socialism. You could tell that story in, in 2020 about Trump, but in 2000, it was that, that Cubans were angry at the Democratic Party for how they handled the Elian Gonzalez case. In the, the Nixon election, it was that Cubans were mad at Kennedy and the Democratic Party for how they handled the, the Maria, Bo, or sorry, the, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. But there's also the story that when Cubans were first starting to get involved in politics in the state of Florida, the Democratic Party, who had a stronghold since the Civil War, didn't accept them. They didn't care for them. They didn't think they were valuable. They didn't think they had anything to, to, to offer. And they didn't think they were a force to be reckoned with. The Republican Party had nothing to lose, gave them opportunities, and they started winning local races, eventually state races, and eventually congressional races. Um, and so all these things probably have some semblance of the truth in them. But to take just one snapshot and say, well, this explains the entire voting behavior of this group or some of the people in this group, I, I think is wrong. But I, I want to really hone in on, on the party. And in this case, I want to speak about the Democratic Party. And I, I would jump back to, to 1986, to Janet Jackson's um, song and ask, you know, what have you done for me lately? And I might argue that you could say, especially for Latinos overall, if we want to use this umbrella term, what have you done for me ever? When we think about how the Democratic Party has brought in particular groups that they see as the bankable votes every time. You have the New Deal to explain the white working class vote, which as we've seen has started to erode as, as a reliable uh, base. You have the civil rights era to explain a reliable black vote. Um, we don't have anything to explain a reliable Latino vote. We just have this assumption about this group that for some reason would, would, would have interests that were completely aligned with the Democratic Party. So they're not speaking to Latinos necessarily. And I think what that looks like on the ground with a democratic party organizational structure that operates like a franchise. There is a lot of variance in what recruitment and voter engagement looks like. And so Victoria talked a little bit about this with the door knocking, but the reality is that there are some states that have very tightly um, developed relationships between the state party and the marquee presidential candidate and other states where that's simply not the case, where we rely on down ballot candidates such as myself, to be proxy ambassadors for that presidential race. And the problem there is that sometimes we, we aren't being brought in. And so 
You know, the, the Democratic Party relies on targeting high propensity voters, a strategy that's been used before, but that was really honed in by the Obama administration. We have tons of data software tools that helps us target these voters, you know, often known colloquially as super voters. And the issue there is if you rely on that strategy for engaging voters and bringing them out, you systematically exclude young voters who don't have a voter history that would make them a super voter and newly naturalized voters, which would in the American context uh, include a lot of Latino voters. And so I wanna just tell you the quick story about the city that I will, will soon represent in the Rhode Island State Senate. Central Falls, Rhode Island is the most Latino city in, in Rhode Island. And so for a long time, the Democratic Party has reigned here. And in the 2016 election, Hillary took 80% of the vote, Trump took 15. This year, there, Biden took 72% of the vote, Trump took 26. Now, we know that if you do nothing, random switching entropy and probability will tend to favor the losing kind of historically disadvantaged side. And so you could explain some of this movement around, well, the Democratic Party didn't activate any of these voters. And I know that for a fact to be true in, in the Rhode Island case. It was a state that they had relied on coming out Democratic. And so there was no real engagement on the Biden campaign or the Harris campaign of getting Latino voters or really Rhode Island voters to come out in any meaningful way. As a candidate, I, was, I received an email that said, if you want Biden Harris signs for free, you can come by the office to pick them up. The, 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 the farthest extent to true organizing came from an offer to be part of a phone banking campaign to call voters in other states. So in Central Falls, approximately 4,300 people voted in this general election. Of those, about 1,200 voters were people who did not vote in 2016 or 2018. 250 of those were people who recently turned 18. The rest were either recently naturalized or chose to vote again after sitting out the last two elections. Now, these are people that probably got no contact from either party, and especially not the Democratic Party. I know that because I was their proxy ambassador here. Now, you'd look at a place like Georgia and Arizona, they had a clear party strategy for outreach and voter engagement. And Latinos came out and supported the Democratic Party. Other places that didn't have that did not have the same expected kind of large Latino support for the Democratic Party. And so I don't think that it's an issue of the Latino voters doing something wrong, so to speak, or, or exercising a false sense of, of consciousness. I think the problem is a party system that does not engage new voters, does not develop a base that's gonna reliably come out every two to four years to vote for them. And so the party needs to be held accountable in this case. Uh, we, we shouldn't be seeing the, the differences in how the party operates in a place like Georgia compared to a place like Rhode Island. Because over time, the random variation, as it starts getting closer and closer to a 50-50 split, will lead to a higher level of engagement for the losing side, which is what happened, I would argue, with Florida and Cubans in the 60s and 70s, and I think explains a large part of what happened in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. So thank you, and I look, I look forward to engaging with the audience. Thank you guys so much for attending. You know, I know that in this Zoom era, we're all, um, you know, looking for human connection, and that's what brings us to events like these, and we're still, seeking some sort of inspiration for the work that we do. And, and that's why we're here. But I know that we're also kind of zoomed out. And so I know it's no small investment of time to join us for a, an hour, hour and a half. So thank you all. And man, I mean, hearing Victoria and Jonathan talk, I'm, I feel like I, I don't want to say much and just want to get onto the conversation because I want to start talking with you guys. I mean, I, I could pick up on so many of the things you've already mentioned. I mean, um, you know, the, the I, I don't know if failures is too strong of a word, but the failures of the Democratic Party, narratives of the vote in South Florida and Texas compared with other countries. But I can focus, I think, most particularly on this um, three in 10, uh, the other side of the coin that uh, Victoria had talked about, right? She had talked about this um, seven of 10 Latinos who vote for Democrats. And in some ways, I guess I'm telling the other story of the three in 10 who vote for Republicans. And 
I think I can, you know, do this in three ways. I, I wrote a book called The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump. And really it's just about the evolution of a relationship between Hispanics and many conservatives call themselves Hispanics. Um, so that's why I use it in the title. Many of the people I interviewed wanted to be identified that way. But um, you know, I can tell the story of this third quarter to a third of Hispanics who have reliably voted for Republican candidates ever since Richard Nixon's reelection in 1972. And despite the many twists and turns of the Republican Party itself, like uh, moving far to the right on immigration and border control and the rise of the kind of nativist xenophobic um, wing of the Republican Party beginning in the late 1970s and certainly carrying on into the present. Um, and so I can talk about how, despite those shifts, the Latino support for the Republican Party has remained remarkably durable. And I have some ideas about why. I also, um, you know, followed pretty closely over the past four years, the Trump campaign's efforts to court and recruit Latinos. And I think we should make no mistake about it. They, you know, left very few stones unturned. They did a lot of um, recruitment. It wasn't the kind of door to door, although as uh, Victoria mentioned with Tony Gonzalez, there was a lot of Republican door to door efforts, but it also came in the form of um, events hosted by the Trump administration or um, ads and things like that. So uh, social media campaigns, all of, all of the above. So, um, you know, I think I can talk a lot about the Latinos for Trump campaign. And, um, you know, thinking a little bit about this 70-30 split, I think if I were um, trying to win elections and, and thinking only about electoral victories, the 30% um, is more easy to dismiss. But I think as because we all know that like winning 30% of a vote is is not going to win you an election. So of course, in an electoral sense, understood that way, the 70% the is key. Um, but I would argue also that in terms of understanding, uh, you know, who Latinos are, and, you know, the uh, to the extent that that's possible, you know, trying to understand 100% of our communities, as a scholar and a teacher, trying to explain to students, um, you know, who Latinos are, who we've been over the past several hundred years, I don't think it's so easy to dismiss um, even the 30% of the Latino community that has reliably voted for conservatives. And I, I think that historically, you know, we've tended to dismiss them as partially as Jonathan's talking about as um, race traders or sellouts or pochos. And I just, I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, I also don't know if it's politically useful in terms of engagement and understanding and outreach. Um, I think it's uh, more dismissive than anything else and doesn't help us understand who Latinos are and have been. And then I think the last thing I can talk about, because I've been interviewing um, Latino conservatives a lot for the past month, ever since the election. And what I can say is that they feel a lot of momentum right now. And they have told me that um, they made history, as they put it, and they moved the needle. And what they're talking about, I was kind of curious about this idea because I was like, well, you know, what do you mean by you made history? George W. Bush won a greater share of the Latino vote than Donald Trump did in 2016 or 2020. And what they said is, yeah, but what Trump accomplished and what we accomplished as a Latinos for Trump campaign is a hundred times more impressive than what George W. Bush accomplished because um, we did it organically. So what they believe is that Latino conservatism is on the rise through, you know, ta table, kitchen table conversations among Latinos or through conversations in church or through the Trump trains and boat brigades and uh, caravans, all of these things. And so they have described it as uh, a, a momentum that they are going to seize. Now, I should say that a lot of the people I've talked to too kind of echo some of Jonathan's concerns about whether the RNC will actually listen to them. They think that 
a lot of grassroots organizations like the Republican National Hispanic Assembly or the Libre Initiative um, effectively reached out to Latinos this cycle, but they didn't always feel like they had support from the RNC. So it's interesting that on both sides, there's this sense that the party structures have ignored some of the on the ground grassroots efforts. And I think Republicans feel that as much as Democrats do. So, you know, I think that we, um, you know, in an electoral sense, did they make history? I mean, is 30 or 32% according to exit polls, is that historical? Is it significant? Um, I think that it's still important to consider the shift, not only in South Florida or South Texas, but I was interviewing the progressive pollster, Carlos Odio of Equis Research, and he was describing a kind of baseline shift, even in democratic strongholds like Chicago, Philadelphia, um, Georgia, other places, even Arizona and Nevada, where Trump won a greater share of Latino support, even in California. And, uh, you know, people keep pointing to California as an interesting example of the shift just because it's not at all a swing state. And not, the campaign, the Trump campaign, put like zero effort into winning the Latino vote in California, but there was still a shift in Orange County and other places towards Trump. So, um, as a Democrat, I don't want to ignore the shift either. So I think those are some things I can talk about, but I'm really excited to have the conversation. Good, hey, what's up? I mean, what more, what more can I say? Uh, I mean, what a brilliant group of people. Um, let me, I mean, you guys can see me, right? All right, so every, you can see me, you can hear me. Gerardo, give me a thumbs up if you can see oh, me. Oh yeah. Okay, good. So I don't know if you got a sense that I have an, a book out. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> I mean, look, the publisher sent it to me, so of course I'm gonna use it. But one of the things that this book dealt with, deals with, it, and, and in my writing of it, <clears throat> was um, a real truth on the issue of immigration based on policy. This will not be a surprise to any of the people who are on this panel, right? Is that both the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of the issue of immigration, a pox on both of their houses. They have both, thrown immigrants under the bus in terms of policies. So I think that just kind of gives context in terms of the larger questions that are being raised in terms of the outreach on the part of the Democratic and the Republican Party and their lack of interest, <clears throat> you know, potentially in terms of actually engaging uh, with, with, uh, with Latino voters. So just a couple of thoughts, uh, real brief, and then I, I too want to really hear your questions. So. Um, this election was definitely powered by black women and uh, by grassroots organizations um, that were not necessarily uh, party affiliated, but people who just took it upon themselves. Um, and, and much of that had to do with the, the movement for black lives and organizing black voters. In many <clears throat> of these key states, Latinx, Latino and Latina voters were kind of like the rear guard push, right? So for example, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, people don't necessarily think of Latino and Latina voters, but all of us know that actually they are there. They have been there in places like Michigan for over a hundred years, in places like Georgia over the last 25 years, but they, are, they were able to do this rear guard push. On the other hand, in places like Nevada and Arizona, Latinos and Latinas, and the 10 year long grassroots um, organizing that was spurred by the anti-immigrant legislation in Arizona, SB 1070. I was there on the ground in April of 2010, where young Latinos and Latinas were becoming activists because they had to worry about their parents and their family members. Some of them were undocumented themselves too. <clears throat> and I just remember thinking they have no idea what they've just inspired. This group of, you know, high schoolers or college students who probably would have been partying, but now they're organizing. Flipping Arizona is what that looks like. So for young people, you need to understand your role in all of this. And, and I really do hope you understand. I mean, Jonathan clearly is an example of that, but your role as a voter and as an organizer um, and anything that you do. And I do believe that those of you who have lived through this election your view on electoral politics will never be the same. And for that reason, okay, thank you to that guy who I'm not gonna mention. Um, <clears throat> so 
I wrote a piece soon after the election criticizing the Democratic Party, who, by the way, neither Kamala Harris no Joe Biden, nor Joe Biden have given me the interview yet, even though I spoke to all of the other candidates who we asked to speak to. Um, and I had to come to this because I've been covering this a bit longer than all of you um, in the sense that, yeah, soy medio viejita, pero entonces lo que pasa es that the, the Dems, it's like you're just lazy. So it's, it's like you just actually, because there's no other reason to explain. Look at all of the brilliant people you have on right now. I mean, Democratic Party operatives should be listening in and taking notes to come for plans of action from this conversation. I don't know if they're there. Um, I just made a note. Florida was not a surprise to me at all because we've been watching it for a while and because you understand the evangelical vote in Florida. But Florida Latinos are not Pennsylvania Latinos. <clears throat> and Pennsylvania is going to become a Latino state increasingly. And so what happened in Pennsylvania is like the flip of, of Florida, which used to be a must win state. Um, very concerned about how quickly the narrative turned to what's the matter with Latinos and Latinas? Like, what's the matter with you? And we all had to be just like, oh my God, seriously? Like, have you been talking to Latino and Latina voters over the past 35 years? They are, there are Republicans, yes. Am I fascinated by Latino and Latina Trump voters? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to know everything about them more and more. Um, but it's also not a surprise to those of us who have been seeped in this. Um, what continues to be off-putting is how the narrative shifts so that Latinos and Latinas are not leading the narrative. Um, I'm sure you all, I'm assuming that uh, those of us on the panel, you know, had the same reaction when not the Monday, but the Tuesday after the election, we tune into the most listened to podcast, The Daily from the New York Times. And basically, um, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but you had basically two smart white guys who were saying, God, but you know, what's up with those Latinos? And, um, and anyway, our polling was really bad with them yet again, but we're going to talk as if we're experts right now. Um, so the invisibility factor for Latinos and Latinas is extraordinary. In the face of that, we took control um, and we turned out in these numbers. And that in and of itself is the story that we need to be telling, which is we turned out. We turned out even if you didn't come and knock on our doors, we still turned out. Um, and, and I don't think that it can be, um, it, it can be something that can be counted on. Um, and still, uh, I, I think actually at this point, both the Democratic and the Republican parties are in a, a, a something of a state of flux and I would say in terms of four years out, probably the Republicans have a better sense of what they're planning on doing than, the Repu than, than even the Democrats at this point. So thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for those comments and, and those insights. I mean, I, I'm also really looking forward to the conversation and I uh, have just learned so much in the last you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, so as folks probably saw from the description of the event, our focus was on one, breaking down the monolith or this myth of the Latinx vote as this monolithic category, and two, understanding the implications of Latinx votes, uh, voter turnout, uh, you know, preferences, stuff like that. And I feel like the panel has done a really great job so far of talking about those issues. And so what I'm going to do is follow up with a few questions uh, and hopefully start some conversation and then we can turn to the audience Q&A. So uh, folks in the audience definitely um, share your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so the first question I had for you all was uh, about the idea or the notion of race and ethnicity within the Latinx community. And I see that um, we also got a question in the Q&A from uh, Katie Duarte about uh, race and ethnicity as well. So what do what is the race and ethnic identity of the Latinx community of given that we have white passing Latinx folks, we have people who identify as brown, um, mestizo, folks who identify as Afro-Latinx. Um, what do you all think might be the impact of these different racial and ethnic identities in terms of how folks came out and voted uh, in the elections? And also, what does this mean for relationships between Latinx voters uh, and communities and other communities of color, BIPOC communities, uh, whether it's you know coalitions or challenges to coalitions? But that was just a, an initial question I had for for all of you panelists. It's a great question. I mean, I 
I think that in general, you know, in the field of Latina and Latino studies, over the past several years, we've been about introducing complexity into how we understand Latinas and Latinos. So there's a lot of new work on Afro-Latinidad, Central Americans, indigeneity among Latinos, and you know the fact that you know many migrants coming these days from Mexico, for example, are indigenous speakers and don't speak Spanish. So I think there are all kinds of ways of um, thinking in more complex ways about who Latinas and Latinos are. But to be honest, I mean, from my my understanding, and I'd love to hear if other people know other things, but there's still not a lot of scholar, scholarly work about how the ethnic and racial backgrounds of Latinas and Latinos influence their political decisions. And so, for example, I, I kind of took, not offense, that's not the right word, but I was kind of, I found jarring Nicole Hannah-Jones tweeted on election night that, well, you look at Florida, this this happened right after Florida was called and people started to feel surprised about what happened in South Florida. And she said, well, you know, that's all about white Cubans, but you can't tell me that indigenous Guatemalans or black Puerto Ricans feel the same way. Maybe there's some truth to that, but I also don't think that you can reduce Latino support for Trump to white Cubans. Um, I think we need to wrestle with the fact that someone like Enrique Tarrio, the Latinos for Trump guy in Florida and the national chairman of the Proud Boys is an Afro-Latino. What does that mean? Um, you know, and I don't claim, I don't think he's representative of how Afro-Latinos feel, but it's still something to wrestle with. But, you know, those, those are some early ideas about race and ethnicity. Oh, the last thing I'll say is I think it's been fascinating to watch after the election, how a whole conversation has emerged about the, the very existence of a Hispanic and Latino category. And a lot of that has to do with debates about whether Latinos behave as a block or as swing voters, you know, in, independent minded swing voters or whatever. And that might have to do with um, this conversation about race and ethnicity too, because if you think about Latinos as a block who votes together because we've been racialized in certain ways, I think that's part of the conversation. The only thing that I would add that's super smart is just that um, I don't think we have enough information. And I think that, it, I don't think Nicole is correct. I think it's very, it's hard to make those kinds of generalizations and to make these assumptions. And I, I think we, you know, the, 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 the academic studies on Central American voters Central American, now US voters is gonna be super important. But mm -hmm. there is a moment in history that I think is worth mentioning, which is that you have a, a moment in history where Latinos and Latinas um, are living through the nationalization of the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And so many of their children or themselves are making decisions to identify with the Black Lives Matter movement as allies and supporters, even if they themselves are not Afro-Latino. And that, that has interesting long-term, and I think about myself as a, you know, I was young in the late 1960s, but it was clear which side my mother had chosen for us that we were on. We mm -hmm. were on the side with Dr. Martin Luther King. He was the closest thing to someone who looked like us in the sense that he was not white and made us feel like we were a part of that conversation. So I think this moment you're you're having some of that similar experience but at the same time i agree with heraldo you cannot um, dismiss this other pressure which is to build on this uh, latino latina republican um vibe which i don't know if we can say it won't appeal to afro latinos i don't know if we can make that generalization yeah. so i would like to add on an additional dimension, right? So we have the ethnic dimension of, of Latinidad, and then we have the racial dimension. And I think another critical dimension is that of generation, that of X, you know, whether you're a Gen Z or, or a millennial, because I think how we process race in general, and then just looking within the Latino community is different. Um, I recently read Paola Ramos's book. After I read Maria's book, which I've got to give a shout out to that. Maria and I had a great panel discussion at the Texas Tribune. So for, for all y'all, your reading list over the over the break, Maria's book and Paola Ramos's book on Latinx. 
And Paola's book zeroes in on the intersection of ethnicity, race, and Gen Z, and to an extent, millennials. And, and you see this very interesting identity that's formed there around racial justice and social equity. But when I look at my parents, or when I look at maybe even folks within the Gen Xer category, I don't necessarily see the same trends. I think it's a lot more ad hoc, where you have some tatas and nanas down on the border who see the Black Lives Matter movement, and A, they don't identify with it, and B, they have some negative feelings about it. So when we're talking about intersections, we also have to lop in another one to understanding how they eventually um, you know, come to fruition in terms of preferences and vote and action. I, I would just add one last piece in, in saying that I, I, identities are projects. And sorry, I love me across the street from the cops. Um, identities are projects and we have to consider, <laughs> no, there's a big fire in CF right now. All right, that's the last one, sorry. So we, we need to think about where, when, and how an identity is, is being developed. And you know it, this is probably different for people who are born here and grow up here. And it'll vary by where in the US they're born and grow up. And it'll also differ for people who come here from another country. And, and so it's, it's, it's been my experience that some folks uh, first see themselves from their origin country before they come to see themselves as Latino. And in some cases, it's, it's that the new context uh, creates the necessity to become part of this new group. And in some cases, it doesn't. And so in a place like Rhode Island, you know, there wasn't a clear dominant majority Latino group. So that when you start having political organizing here, there is this kind of like pan-ethnic Latinidad that you need in order to win any office. And so when you get a Dominican or a Guatemalan or a Colombian who's elected to an office here in Rhode Island, it's with the support of Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Guatemalans, Colombians, um, Salvadorans, now Mexicans. And that's not always the case in other places. So, so in Florida, in, in Miami-Dade County, it's hard to win an election as a, as a Nicaraguan, as a Colombian. Uh, it's not as hard as a Cuban, or at least more common to win as a Cuban. And so I, I think that the conditions on the ground in each place are different, uh, and they contribute towards a different development of identity. So does everybody see themselves as Latino in the U.S.? No. Um, and, and we need to have a conversation about why that is. And there's a lot of work that goes into creating those things, right? Cristina Mora has a great book on making Hispanics. And Gerardo mentions, you know, those folks who choose to still identify as Hispanic. And, and you know, she would argue that it's, it's an intersection of, of bureaucrats, of activists, of, of media wanting to take advantage of this larger group in some ways um, for material reasons, but also for solidarity reasons that haven't necessarily completely come to fruition yet, I would argue. And, and so, you know, we can tend to that garden and try to grow that identity and make it so that, you know, we start seeing our, our immediate policy concerns as related, not just across Latinos, but, you know, here in, here in Central Falls and Pawtucket, there is a large Cape Verdean population that is almost completely ignored by the political establishment. And so to have a conversation with them about how driver's licenses for undocumented folks is not just a Latino issue. It's also a Cape Verdean issue. It's also a, a Portuguese issue. It's all and like that. That type of work is something that needs to be actively done, and not something you can just expect to happen organically or naturally. Yeah, I think that um, you know all, all the insights are, are that you all provided were super fascinating and, and shed a lot of light on the complexities of Latinx identity, of voting, of community mobilization and formation, of local politics. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the next question I have is about immigration policy, uh, and Maria, you kind of touched on this and, uh, and have done a lot of excellent reporting on, on this issue. So I guess the question for everybody is, um, what role did Trump's approach to immigration policy and its effect on the Latinx community, you know, the ongoing or the lawsuit with DACA and other things and, um, and related immigration policies play uh, in the election and also the Biden 
uh, administration or, or you know campaigns discussion of immigration and the promises they've made to DACA recipients and undocumented communities uh, and immigrants in, in general. I, I guess I wonder if folks could comment on the role of immigration, immigration policy. Um, some Latinx folks are immigrants, some are descendants of immigrants, so we're not all immigrants. Uh, but even that, uh, if folks could just comment on that, if people have thoughts. You know, I, I think it, one thing that stands out for me is that in 2015, Donald Trump began his campaign by insulting immigrants, specifically uh, Mexican immigrants like myself and my family, um, and that his entire kind of administration was run on the whole build a wall thing. And then when he runs again, um, it's like nobody even asked about that. I mean, there was one question and the last presidential debate, but I, I found that in the sense of um, an argument for why we need to have more diverse political reporting uh, across the country, uh, which is why I, I just created my own company, created my own politics talk show, because we just have to do it ourselves. Um, you know, the data, um, as far as I understand it, shows that Latinos and Latinas immigration is not the number one issue. I'm not surprised by that. In many ways, it's almost like, oyeme, los republicanos y los demócratas. No, entonces, like it's like um, it's like you know putting uh, hope on something that you know is not going to deliver. So I kind of understand it, also because they're um, it's our livelihood, right? This is what this is like. It's our it's about the work that we came to do. Whether it, my father, who was a medical doctor who helped to create the cochlear implant, or somebody who's doing more um, lower skilled work. Um, so it's frustrating that it is not the number one issue, but I, I understand it completely. And for me, um, I've had to understand what my role is. So that's why if it's not number one in terms of the voter, it is number one in terms of my role as a journalist to be constantly pushing that. Um, and just finally, because, you know, when people say to me, um, you know, what what is what is Joe Biden going to do or the immigration crisis or problem? We, as I say, we don't have an immigration problem at this point. There's net zero migration. We, we have a refugee problem, but what we have in this country, not a problem, an issue, but what we have in this country, it's not an immigration issue. We have a human rights crisis that has been, um, that is uh, on, on the backs of people who, whose only real crime is that we were not born in this country. And for that, our uteruses are taken, our babies are taken, our children are taken, uh, we are raped in detention facilities. And so my thing in terms of the, maybe this is why they don't wanna give the interview, it's cause like, don't you have the perfect reason to say a halt to all deportations, a shutting down to all of these places, an immediate reunification with, by the way, a perpetual lifetime um, mental health services for all of the immigrant migrant families and refugee families who were impacted. But that's just me. So this next semester, I'm going to be um, teaching my, my normal kind of immigration graduate seminar that I do every year. Um, during the Trump years, it has been quite interesting to change because over the, the last several years, we had just kind of this stagnant federal immigration issue, right? So there was no comprehensive immigration reform and a, and a lot of the action was at the state and local level, right? So think back to Arizona's SB 1070. And I think that we can also link that to what we saw in terms of Arizona going blue. We saw local ordinances. But then when Trump comes into office, we see a ton of immigration policy movement, not legislation. Again, there is no movement by the part of Congress but in the form of executive actions and even more specifically in terms of rule changes, which, you know, they're not sexy, they're not big, but they can have huge consequences for the lives of immigrants or, um, or folks who may be refugees or asylees. So under the Trump administration, we saw over 400 rule changes and executive orders that took place. For those of you that are interested in this, the Migration Policy Institute put together a couple of months ago, I think it was over the summer, a great catalog of everything that had happened under the Trump administration, the dismantling of 
a lot of what we knew as kind of traditional immigration policy post 1965, the Hart Seller Act. If I were a betting woman, we're not going to see comprehensive immigration reform in the next two years. Uh, you know, we we are likely going to have a divided um, government. You know, depending on what happens in Georgia, but again, my money is on it being a divided government. However, I am cautiously optimistic about having a, a lot of really targeted and thoughtful action coming out of the White House. So, you know, rule changes can be very impactful. And a lot of the executive orders, you know, that's that's the bad thing about executive orders is that they can be easily rolled back. And so President Biden, President-elect Biden is going to be able to roll back a lot of the things that the Trump administration put into place. So that is good news that a lot of that chaos, a lot of that human rights violation will be able to disappear literally overnight. The question is, how are we going to reform our immigration system? And again, I think we're going to go back to what happened during the second term of the Obama administration. Not a lot. Um, my hope is that the Biden administration will follow the course in terms of not deporting in mass like it happened during the first Obama administration. But there are some really creative things that, at least in the short term, the Biden administration can do through executive order. So that's going to be something that I'm looking for of what policy comes out of the White House and agencies, especially DHS, um, going forward. I, you know, I feel like my role on this panel, like so many others after the election, has just simply been to provide the Latino Republican perspective, which isn't entirely comfortable for me as a Democrat, but. Um, you know, I still, I, I've still, you know, committed more time maybe than I would like over the past month to trying to talk, to continue having conversations with Latino conservatives about how they feel about this moment. And immigration has, of course, come up. So I'm, I'm giving the Latino Republican perspective on this, even if it's, I mean, it's not even if, but certainly even though it's one I don't endorse myself. And I have to say, I don't know that they're right about what um, they say about immigration, but here are a couple things to think about. First, um, you know, it relates to something I mentioned earlier about what many Latino conservatives think to be the historic character of this election. And even though George W. Bush won a greater share of the Latino vote in 2000, 2004, what they think is that uh, the Trump campaign shook up what we thought we knew about Latinos. And they've come to calling the Bush approach Republican light. And what they've meant by that is the theory of the case with George W. Bush was that the way Republicans appealed to Latinos was to support comprehensive immigration reform. And it's kind of become a settled narrative that in the months before 9-11, right after George W. Bush was inaugurated, he was kind of partnering with his pal Vicente Fox to craft comprehensive immigration reform. So that was the theory about how Republicans reached out to Latinos. But a lot of the Latino conservatives I've been talking to have been describing how Trump upset the apple cart, how that he flipped the script and showed that instead, what this election showed is that the way to reach Latinos is through truly conservative ideology. And so it's not about comprehensive immigration reform. It's about truly conservative ideology. And what they've told me is that Democrats, in fact, have have it wrong. They misunderstand immigrants because, for example, I mean, again, and this is where I want to be clear that I don't know that they're right. I don't think they're necessarily right. But here's what they believe. They say that immigrants from, you know, Venezuela or Nicaragua, they didn't like it when Americans were toppling statues over the summer because that made our cities look like Managua and Caracas. And they left that situation because America works and they wanted to live and partake in a functioning society where they believed that they could get ahead. I also think that Republicans have not given up on recruiting new immigrants. It's not that only Democrats think that immigration is their issue. So I interviewed the chairman of the El Paso Republican Party, and he told me that he shows up personally to all of the naturalization ceremonies in El Paso to hand out literature about what the Republican Party stands for. 
And also, I think if you look at evangelical churches, you know, evangelicalism among Latinos is largely an immigrant religion. You know, you have many Latin American immigrants who are evangelicals. They move to the United States, start uh, evangelical churches, join evangelical churches. So my point is just that there is a Republican narrative about how their party actually taps into the immigration, immigrant ambition to you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and find a better life in the United States. And then the last thing I'll say about immigration is that in my conversation with Carlos Odio, again, from Equis Research, one of the pollsters in Miami, he told me that what he's worried about is that if this idea that there was a shift toward Trump becomes the accepted narrative or, or an important narrative of the election, is that the lesson Democrats will take from it is like, well, you know, if if it seems evident that even Latinos don't prioritize immigration, why should we? And so he believes that the Democratic Party could decide to disinvest even more from, they could give up on Miami if they think Miami is lost. They could um, you know, not choose to fight for comprehensive immigration reform if they come to believe that Latinos don't prioritize immigration. So those are just a few thoughts. I feel like I'm just channeling things that conservatives have told me over the past couple of weeks. So I, I just want to add um, three three quick things. The, the first is, is that immigration itself, right, is, is a natural process, right? Like living, dying, uh, reproducing, and migrating are things that we in the social sciences accept as natural processes. Now, the, the, the politics at play here are the things that are socially constructed. And, and you know, although immigration is natural, the US's involvement in the 19th and 20th century in our economies and in our politics across Latin America was not natural and did drive a lot of the migration. My family comes from a paradise. I tell people all the time, some of my ancestors kept walking south for a reason and some of my ancestors sailed south for a reason. The weather here sucks, all right? The food isn't as good. And look, I, I'm very privileged and very honored to, to be American, to have been the first person in my family born here. But if the geopolitics were different, I would rather still be in my mountain paradise in Medellin. So I say all that to say, like, look, this is a problem that, that your state sowed. And the second piece is looking at the records of both of these parties and leaderships and types of administration, um, they, they both have piss poor records, right? Obama was the deporter in chief before we got Trump and all his anti-immigrant stuff. So like, it, it, I think it's wrong to say that the that either party would, would be better. And, and Maria is totally spot on on this, right? Like that, that we shouldn't be hedging our bets that either of these parties is, it really has our, our best interest at heart. But the last point I'll make is, I think we assume a lot about Latinos when, we bring this question up, right? There's, there's, a, there's a bias here. You're asking Latino voters if they care about immigration. They are, by virtue of the fact that they can vote, already citizens. And so what you're expecting is that they have this level of solidarity that we don't necessarily see in everybody else. And that, and that we don't, like the, the working class, the white working class in America isn't really voting in its own interest or for its other people. And so I, I think you're asking a lot of people to say like, hey, I now that I have citizenship and that because of the way this system works, I can hopefully apply for my family and then and direct people around me to get it, that I would now all of a sudden also care about everybody else. Something that I was really worried about a few years back and I don't think is completely off the table, but we don't talk about it enough is the threat of abolishing birthright citizenship in this country. I think if you had that conversation, then you have Latinos way more engaged and you have people wake up to, to the fear. And for me, this really started when the Dominican Republic stripped Haitians that are people of Haitian descent born on their land from citizenship. Prior to that, in the Western hemisphere, we didn't have this kind of threat of, of your rights, right? Like everyone's like, well, Palestine, mm, that's tough. Sorry for them. But now that it's on this side of the world, and that we had a president like we did and a sense of nativism like we've had for the past, you know, I would say decade, not really more than just the, the last four years. I don't want to give Trump too much credit. Um, we need to start having a serious conversation about what would happen if they threatened to take that away and where Latinos would stand then. Because a lot of the folks that vote in Texas have spent their whole life, they, they never lived in what is now Mexico, right? They happen to have been the descendants of Spanish folks, but they're Tejanos. 
right? Um, and I think, you know, Puerto Ricans are American citizens. As soon as they, they touch land, they get all the rights. And so, I, you know, I, I feel like the, the immigration issue is, is asking people who, who aren't naturally inclined to really care in the way that we assume that they are. I want to move to Cedar Falls so you can be my representative. Are you guys taking people, <laughs> new inhabitants? Central Falls, and we'd love to have you. We'd love to Central have Falls, you. sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> if we had everybody in person, we could all go to Central Falls and eat afterwards. Uh, next time, next time. Uh, yes. Um, so I'll, uh, thanks everyone for your, your comments and your insight. I'm going to shift to the audience q and if, if that's okay with folks. Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in. So uh, in our remaining time, I wanted to shift to that. Um, we have one question um, by uh, someone who didn't share their name, but they say, uh, I'm hoping that panelists can expand on the results of South Texas. Can they specifically just talk about the role of the border wall, detention center, border enforcement economics that have played into improving Trump performance in traditionally democratic strongholds? Oh, Alejandro Villegas. Uh, and so, yeah, folks could kind of comment on that, uh, South Texas and the kind of immigration industry. You know what, if, if you think about the fact that, um, I think you may have been getting ready to say the immigration and uh, detention, deportation, mass industrial complex, many of the people who work in that whole complex of detaining, deporting, et cetera, are Latinos and Latinas who live along the Rio Grande Valley. It just is. That's where a lot of these detention places, these camps are. Um, so I think you have to, um, you know, for me, having been crossing that border for the entirety of my life, either literally on that border or by plane, to now go there and see that it has become like the worst like at the height of the Berlin Wall, that kind of razor wire everywhere. It's like, are you kidding? Like what, what happened here? It, but there may be a percentage of, of people who respond to that. Um, and I mean, I'm always shocked, not surprised, but you know, when I will find, uh, a, whether I find this particular person was in uh, Iowa, a new Latino voter in Iowa who had been was now a citizen and took 25 years to bring his family over the right way. And then he was like, no, but no, now they have to build a wall. Now they have to build a wall. Now that I, you know, and it's just like, ¿Cómo es esto? so I, I think that that, that notion of getting over and, and then closing the door behind you is, is, is very, very real understanding the locality right all politics is local that a lot of the economic base for these poor rural podunk communities are the border patrol i mean the border patrol is i don't know if it's majority latino but if it's not majority latino it's pretty darn close and also the detention center um, industry so just in terms of what the economic base is there's that. So I think that is a, a core piece that we need to consider. The second is that Texas is just more conservative, right? Black, white, or brown. Texan, you know, like when you look at Latinos in Texas, they've always voted a little bit more Republican than all other Latinos with the exclusion of Florida, right? We always gotta kind of put Florida over here, but look at the voting trends over the last several decades and you see that Texans just have that in them. There's a little bit more ideological conservatism there. So that's the second point. And then the third leg of this stool is understanding the, the, the geography of it. And this goes back to Jonathan's point, which is, there are a whole bunch of Tejanos where the border crossed them. So the immigration experience is, is like something that they hear, but you know, their great, 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 great grandparents have always been in South Texas. So even though they're on the border, technically the lived experience itself is not there. So I think that is also an important point to understanding Texas. And I'll just reiterate my point about also the oil and gas industry. There was that component piece. And the, and the Texas GOP is really good and really organized. I mean, they have a ton of resources and they have their stuff in order. The democratic infrastructure here in Texas 
is slowly but surely building. They were in the wilderness for close to two decades and over the last three or four electoral cycles have really started building it up, but they're still nowhere near to where they were, you know, back during the Ann Richards days. So all of that kind of helps understand that kind of Rio Grande, you know, South Texas puzzle that so many folks were scratching their head about. You start breaking it down and you're like, well, yeah, I, I can see why, why that happened. Um, if I could jump in for just a second, and I would love to even hear Vicky's thoughts about this, and I will always defer to anything that Vicky says about Texas as the Tejana, but, uh, or I guess, I don't know if you read that political p piece about how it wasn't Latinos who voted for uh, Trump, it was Tejanos who voted for Trump. So mm -hmm. yes, I, don't even, yes. I don't even know if it has become a slander to call you a Tejana or something like that to identify with you with the group. But in any event, the, the other, the only, the other things that I, I think Texas is very interesting and there's a lot of interesting questions to ask about Texas and what it might mean for the future. So one of the more interesting theories I heard was from uh, a guy at Washington University, Ignacio Sanchez Prado. I think he's a literature scholar, but he was also telling me that there's also, and he's a Mexicanist primarily, so he kind of sees American politics through the lens of a Mexicanist. Apparently in the Rio Grande Valley, there's a, a lot of support for AMLO for some reason. I, I, hadn't heard that, but I don't know if you, I mean, there are like long transnational ties, of course, between um, the United States and Mexico, but um, I don't know if there happens to be a greater share of support for AMLO in the Rio Grande Valley than elsewhere. Um, and we know about like Trump's kind of famous AMLO bromance. Um, it's very strange. But also another interesting question that's been raised, I think, about South Texas is like, you know, because you know, Tejanos or Mexican Americans, Hispanics, Latinos are the vast majority of the population there. Maybe they don't feel like a marginalized, discriminated against population in the same way that groups in cities do, for example. That's another theory I've heard floated. And then, so therefore, maybe South Texas is more like rural Iowa or rural Nebraska than it is like Houston. So that's an interesting question. I think it points to this in some ways, what, what was in, in addition to like a generational divide or a gender divide, a growing like urban rural divide uh, between Latinos. And in some ways, maybe the Latinos in South Texas have more in common with like Latinos in the Central Valley than they do in California, than they do uh, with Latinos just up the road in Houston or in the case of California, like Los Angeles or San Francisco. Um, so I don't know, but the other interesting thing, and by the way, I don't love how Republicans are now, like Marco Rubio, the Republican party is about to become the working class party for non-white people. Um, and their idea is that part of what's driving this rural urban divide is the ingrained cultural conservatism of Latinos in rural areas. And I hate this idea because I don't think that like, it, it's wrong to call working class Latinos culturally conservative inherently. I, I just don't think that's true. But um, the other question I think to ask about South Texas is whether it's gonna be durable. I mean, does it signal some sort of trend going forward or is it really a, a one-off um, just because of the particularities of this election cycle the personality of Trump I think you could ask this generally about 2024 you know what how unique is the 2020 election or is it a sign of things to come and Texas raises these questions I think uh, so the next question from the audience uh, from Brian Bermeo is, quote, as a panelist has pointed out, the Dem party uh, has become lazy and reliant on a hom homogeneous Latinx vote. How do you see or what do you see in the Democratic Party currently? Or what do you expect to be responding to the GOP's media punditry uh, that seems to be capitalizing on the, quote, American dream and cultural assimilation that is prevalent in uh, many moderate low propensity voters? Uh, and then they explain the GOP has managed to turn off many Latinx voters by painting a moderate and capitalist democratic party as just elect politicians such as AOC and calls to action such as defund the police. Do you think the democratic party will push back on this public perception? Mm. Um, I, I'd like to jump in and just say, I think the democratic party is, is trash in, in, in the sense that they, they have done a, a terrible job at growing the next generation of leaders. Now, I think in, in the national stage, what we see is they'll co-opt people that come out from outside the establishment and make it seem like it was them. 
right? But, you know, despite all the bad stuff that he's been saying recently, Obama did just publicly criticize the DNC for not giving AOC a bigger platform at the convention. And I think he was completely spot on. You know, we have a problem, not just of succession, but also of, of bringing people in and, and teaching them what it means to be in the party. You know, like, like I said, we had over 200 young people who registered to vote, which is awesome that they cared that much. You know, our city has somewhere around the range of 20,000 people so that, that they cared to register and to vote in this election, I think is important. Um, no party reached out to them, Republican or Democrat. Right. And so I think the this expectation and putting the onus on the, the voters or on Latinos to be going out and saying like, hey, you know, can I can I be part of this club is ridiculous. And that's how it works right now. It's about maintaining power. And I think it's it's worse in places where a party already reigns supreme. So in Rhode Island, you know, it's it, it would it would be very close and not impossible, but it's highly improbable that the, the that Republicans would, would take over, say, our General Assembly. We've had Republican governors before, for sure. Um, but this is a democratic state. And that, I think, has led to a kind of ossifying and calcifying of the Democratic Party here. There, there, there have been young people advocating and trying to create more avenues for pathways for young people to be involved. But every time, I mean, there's just, there's tons of roadblocks. And so I think the party needs to find a way to, to cultivate its next generation of leaders, to give them platforms to speak and, and to allow their agenda to, to be what's driving. You know, one of the things, one of the big narratives that came out of this election was, well, um, you know, uh, Latinos are anti-socialism. And the label is, is very broad, very misconstrued, and I think very misunderstood in American politics. But if we look at the way, you know, the, the Florida minimum wage referendum is, is a great example of this. People, if, if, if you remove the labels and just give them the policy, they will often vote for stuff that they realize is going to benefit them, right? And so what we've seen in Rhode Island happen is we had this huge progressive wave that ousted long-term incumbents. I beat a 12-year incumbent myself. We had people who beat senior members of the General Assembly. And we ran on platforms that were pretty left of center. The party took the platform and has now adopted it as their own, but is doing nothing to bring new people in. And so, you know, just being able to, to, to steal the ideas is not enough. You have to bring in the new people. Look, Joe Biden won. I, personally voted for him pretty reluctantly, but the dude is old. Like we're tired of seeing the same people. We had to deal with two cycles of Clinton. Come on. How is it that we have no new people? We have no new people because we're not going to get them. It's not a free market approach. We need to be socializing people into the party. Yes, but also don't be an ageist. Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, I totally feel you in that sense. It's like, you know, come on. And, and your, your critique about the lack of, I mean, if you understand party politics, you have to create leaders. I mean, it's kind of basic. Uh, and so that's why it's like, I don't, I don't understand or I do understand why it's not happening, but. <laughs> I've, seen I've seen your boxing videos, Maria. You are no Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. You know, so on, the, on that pipeline question, Jonathan, I think if, if you build it, they will come. I think we need to start putting a lot more attention and investment in our state. And this is something Republicans are really, really, really good at. And so, you know, I think in looking to build that next generation of Democratic leaders, it's putting the time and money in. A, because it will help the national party and B, because the states are really, I mean, yes, there are your deep blue states like your Rhode Islands and your Californias, but there are a whole bunch of red states, purple states, light blue states that need that investment. I mean, just look at right now where you didn't see any states, um, you know, flip to a democratic legislature and that matters, period, but it especially matters during redistricting years. So I think, you know, in, in being someone who is outside of the beltway, outside of the corridor, I'm always preaching to folks, pay attention to the states, 
pay attention to the localities because that's where you build your bench and look how well it's, it's worked out for the GOP. This is something where we do need to take a page from their playbook. Kevin, uh, am I allowed to ask a quick question as a follow-up to this stuff? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. You could say no, it's totally fine because I don't, I don't have the queue in front of me, but I'm, I'm just curious about like how confident are you guys that the Democrats will take the lesson from this election? I mean, it does feel to me like over the past month, there has been more curiosity and attention to Latinos, who Latinos are. I mean, on the one hand, that's totally typical. It feels like there's this constant rediscovery of Latinos right around election time. Um, but, you know, it feels like it might be more sustainable. How do you guys feel about that? I mean, do you think the conversation will be, the conversation we're participating in now, Will does it have legs? Will it continue over the next few years? And will Democrats, learn a lesson from this. Sorry. Radio silence. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think the radio silence is at least uh, uh, on my behalf, Jerry, is I, I don't know. Uh, institutions are sticky. Uh, you know, MO is sticky, modus operandi. So I think um, it will change is difficult, but I do think that on the heels of a Trump reality, that is a boost to maybe kind of rethink some things and have um, have something that is different in order to forestall kind of a another Trump 2.0 or, or Trump 2024. And I just want to say, just to bring it back to, I'm assuming young people who are watching this. I mean, democracy is a verb. And so it's really, this is one of those historical moments. And when it's like, what are you doing? What are you gonna do? Um, and honestly, for you all in this generation, in my view, um, if we're on this call, if you're in this place, as much as we all have all kinds of personal challenges that we're facing, whether it's you know spiritual, personal, psychological, financial, et cetera, but we have privilege being right here in this level of conversation. And so I'm just putting it back at you that that's why I'm so proud of what Jonathan did. He was like, well, we're gonna run. I mean, when I was my first, I was a green card holder, but I was doing electoral politics to try to get the first Latino on the ballot in the city of Chicago in the late 1970s. So regardless of how radical we may be in terms of our politics, Electoral politics is something that is real in this country. And it's about the vote, but it's about doing this kind of, you know, getting out, finally getting out the vote and being representative. So I'm just throwing it back at you. It's not about sitting and listening. It's what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? You are leaders yourselves already. And so, yeah, I just wanted to put the weight of history on your shoulders. And I appreciate Maria doing that. My, you know, it, it's funny that, that you, you mentioned your, your work in Chicago because it made me think immediately of how much activists had to work against the Democratic Party machine to get real representation in Chicago, right? The same party who we're supposed to be seeing as, as our ally um, was, was the one that was really in our way of, <laughs> of empowerment in, in Chicago. And I think that's true in other places. And so I'm a little bit skeptical about the party. I think we have to I'm a member of, the, I disaffiliated before and I came back. And I say that to say, you know, I think the way that party politics operates, especially in public, is on this presentation of, of hegemony, right? Like there's, there's full agreement, everybody's bought in, you know, you, you don't step away from, and we saw this, I mean, the GOP was kind of uh, handcuffed or, or really I would say almost like strangle held by Trump in, in, in Congress. By, by this kind of ethic, right? Like you're not allowed to, to criticize publicly your party. And I, I'm proud that we have someone like AOC kind of holding the party's feet to the fire with, with the, the platform that she has. And I think we need to become more comfortable with that. It's okay to not always agree, um, but also you need to recognize that, that we're here. Right, like the Democratic Party in Chicago should have recognized that that community mattered, that those people wanted true leadership, not just that looked like them, because they also tried that a lot in Chicago. Right, we're going to run somebody um, with establishment support that just happens to be uh, Mexican American. No, it has to be true substantive representation with issues that matter to that community. And I, I don't think I've seen enough of the Democratic Party doing that 
well or proactively to make me optimistic. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I remember she, she's not here now. Um, I was taking a class with Trisha in the fall of 2008 when Obama got elected. And like a lot of college kids, it was, it was my first election voting. I was super excited. You know, we marched down to the Rhode Island State House. Everybody's dancing, screaming. There's, you know, a kind of Durkheimian collective effervescence. We've won, this is it. And I remember Trisha with like the cool swagger of, of just like a wise person being like, hmm, this actually might make it worse. And, and I think she was right. Initially, I was going to do my dissertation work on how Obama hadn't done anything for people of color. But and interestingly, like, see, if, if Obama had, in that moment, actually done immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform, that would have changed the course of history. It would have taken away, I, I mean, I'd love to hear what, what Vicky and Etal have to say about this, but I just think that's one of the greatest historical failures is that if you would have just committed to doing that, not listen to Rahm Emanuel who said, don't do it. If you would have had your, your, your constitutional scholar hat on and say, I'm not gonna stand behind people being de denied due process because they weren't born in this country, that would have taken the air out of the balloon of the anti-immigrant fervor in my view. And I don't think that Trump would have gotten elected. That's, who knows, but anyway that it's it's about leadership in the end but also again how you as as citizens or not those of us who you know are immigrants without a citizenship can also help push the process that's part of our that's what we have to do as a journalist or as you as citizens and activists yeah i mean i, I think um that it's really exciting to hear everybody talk about this topic because i feel like uh, this is the energy and the momentum that hopefully will be pushing this conversation forward. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely hope it continues uh, within the party and also among folks that um, are just thinking about these issues may not, you know, have decided what party they, they want to affiliate with, but, um, or, or no party. Um, so the next question we have, I know we have about four minutes left. Uh, and so I know we we'll probably won't have everyone getting a chance to weigh in on this question, but I'll just uh, pose the last question that we're able to touch on from the Q&A, which is that um, from Gil Murillo, um, COVID-19 has brought a lot of these forms of discussion, public bridging more viewers across different mediums than was present in the past. Uh, and because of this, the Latinx community has been perhaps more engaged than some of their parents. Um, so if folks have you know, thoughts on intergenerational conversations, the role of media, social media engagement, um, and just kind of the, the scope of of this election. I'll jump in because I have a hard out in three minutes. So just final thoughts here that obviously we have um, been able to harness the power of our virtual reality to reach more and more folks. But I, I, I worry that we lose sight of the importance of that direct contact and especially with our communities that, um, especially our immigrant communities where they do need more of that engagement. You know, they didn't become American voters or like kind of partisans because that's what their great, great grandparents did. So we need to have that civic engagement that is helped by the virtual world, but really ultimately does have to be in that person to person engagement. And with that, I will say bye to my colegas and to my wonderful co-panelists, organizers. Gracias. Yeah, I, I'll just add one, one piece real quick um, that I think is related to what I would argue was the Democratic Party's failure at mobilizing more Latinos um, for, for Biden. But, you know, and Vicky had mentioned this before in her opening remarks, people are more likely to vote for a candidate who they've interacted with face to face with or whose representative has come and knocked on their doors. And so I think that that's, that's true also cross generationally. You know, I, I had friends who said, you know, my, my dad was asking me who I was voting for and, and why. And so, you know, it leads to these conversations. But I think that the, the problem was here, you know, I wasn't, the, uh, you know, putting out balloons and banners for Biden. Uh, I was concerned about my own campaign. We had a mayoral race that was really important here that I was also working with uh, and alongside. And so, you know, I, I wasn't playing the, the Biden trumpet or flute. And it, it, it's often about who, who 
you're voting for who your friends, close family, and people you trust. Sometimes that's that's pop culture figures or, or, or radio personalities or, or people from your church group. Um, but so get, tapping into those networks, I think, is essential and, and leads to the conversations that are similar to the mediums that we're having now. But, you know, before we had Twitter and social media, you know, Dita was hanging out playing parques with her church group afterwards, and they were talking about politics, right? So like that stuff has been happening. The, the issue is, is how are we tapping into those networks or not? Um, and, and what are the issues that are coming up in those conversations? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jonathan, for that. And I know we have one minute left. So I just want to take a moment to thank all the panelists for your insight and uh, your work that you're doing. And, and definitely folks uh, in, in attendance, check out their work, Google them, uh, buy their books, follow their social media. Um, they're continuing to produce amazing work and insight on this topic. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.